she had said that this kid has always wanted to be dropped off at school in the Lamborghini. And so you picked him up. Oh yeah, uh, yeah. And I gotta tell you, that's, I, I, I read that post early in the morning and I'm just thinking, man, what a cool thing to do, man. Like, yeah, I think it was like, yeah, it was, a, it was a high school kid. Yeah, just took him to school one morning in the car. It was, yeah, it was kind of overwhelming because there was like a ton of kids out, outside when we pulled up. Yeah. <laughs> you know? So I was just like, okay. All right, we have another episode of Adversity Kings. We have special guest today, Alex Pratt, correct? Yes, sir. Let's go. And to help me introduce, I have co-host Dave Wang, partner in AK Media as well. And uh, I'm gonna have you help us introduce Mr. Alex. All right, all right. So this is my friend, Alex Pratt. Uh, he is the founder of Good Boy Vodka. You guys have exploded onto the scene, honestly. The last three years, Forbes just did a write-up on you. Um, man, your resume is so long. I mean, we can take up the entire podcast. <laughs> Former super bike racer, boat racer. So you're a pilot as well. Yes, sir. Yep, yep. So I'm sure we're everything gonna... goes fast. <laughs> yeah, I just said off camera that I think you're trying to kill yourself. But that's yeah, okay. no, <laughs> so, just having a good time. <laughs> but we're gonna have fun today. So yeah, Alex. So. Yeah, thanks for coming over, guys. I appreciate it. It's yeah, awesome. Of course. Yeah, we're at his house. You can see the transformer in the background. Who has a transformer in their house? Single guy with Single no wife guy. and no girlfriend. <laughs> <laughs> they, I don't think they would allow it. <laughs> yeah. So anyway, so Alex, what have you been up to lately? Oh, uh, right now um, we're just really busy expanding our um, distribution for our business. Um, we're trying to become a national brand. So um, right now we're in 26 states and we got about nine more states pending that we're opening in the next probably 60 days. And, um, you know, from there, just trying to cover the rest of the country, all the important states. So let's start from the beginning. Um, went to school. College, right? Yep, yep, okay. went to college. Take us from there. Yep, graduated college, um, started working for a uh, family company. We owned a, a 60 year old trailer manufacturing company. I was third generation, um, ran the sales department for them. Um, we sold the private equity about six years ago, and um, I worked for them for about two to three years and then started Good Boy while I was working for them. Um, and then uh, when Good Boy got busy, I left private equity and uh, jumped into the beverage market and it's been kind of a wild ride ever since. <laughs> so why vodka? Why alcohol? Uh, it all kind of happened by accident. I mean, I, uh, I knew that I only wanted to own a consumer brand and I knew that I wanted to, you know, work for myself and run, run my own business. And, um, I think at first we just tried it, you know, and then one thing led to the next and we started getting the big retailers on boards like the Walmarts and the Kroger's and the Myers and stuff like that. And, um, it's when I left and kind of did good boy full time. The business just, uh, we could see that the, that our business case was working and that it was going to be successful and that, um, yeah, we kind of went all in. Yeah, I think the centerpiece, and this is why I've always admired your company, what you're building, is you guys center, center that around a charity that's near and dear to your heart. You want to talk about that? Yeah, yeah. I mean, so our tagline is every pour helps a pup. And the idea behind every pour helps a pup is that we donate a portion of our proceeds back to charities that, you know, align with our mission. And so, you know, we're big into helping American veterans. We're big into helping um, warrior dogs, the dogs that fight for our country and serve for us um, and fight for our freedom. And um, we started our own charity called the Good Boy Foundation and uh, we've got a website thegoodboyfoundation.com and it's got now we donate to hundreds of different charities at the bottom you can scroll through them all and check them all out and um, it's fun you know we kind of come into these markets and we do things that are different um, we're, we're more than just the new exciting vodka brand and new exciting RTD um, you know we offer more than that we're um, uh, helping out the local charities we're getting involved with the communities and we're trying to um, you know kind of build a different uh, a different consumer base that way and it's it's been working really well for us I know we're just kind of diving into the deep water here yeah but, um, can you think back to one specific event one specific thing you guys did that really exploded you guys onto the scene um, yeah, I think at first, you know, when we first started, it was, it was a lot of fun for me, right? I mean, starting a, a alcohol brand was, um, you know, maybe not a passion at the time, but more of a, like a, a fun thing to do. Right. And so I just kind of started putting the logos on the boats and the, the planes and the cars and stuff like that. When I was, um, going to my typical events, I go poker runs and stuff like that. And then, um, we kind of evolved into this whole, like, you know, extreme, 
marketing, you know, fast stuff, kind of, you know, we call our, we tag ourselves as like the world's fastest vodka, you know, we got 200 mile an hour turbine boats and stuff like that. And then I think that um, that kind of resonated with some of the early consumers, which is like our boat racing following and some of our poker run following. And, um, you know, what we've seen is that, you know, a lot of those guys are high net worth individuals, right? And so um, they've got a following of their own, the guys that are, you know, at the top doing these kind of cool things. And so, you know, when they start drinking the product, and they start sharing it with their friends, you know, the people that look up to them start like, hey, what's this? I want to be a part of it. I want to buy it, you know, and I think that that whole trickle down effect happens. And then you kind of have this like super organic marketing that goes on that you can't, you can't pay for, right? And so that I think is kind of what struck the fire with Good Boy. So was it you that gave birth to this idea? Was it a team? Who, who, who came up with this whole concept? and the name yeah i think vodka. one day i woke up and just said i think i want to start a vodka company <laughs> and then i just tried my artist to figure it out yeah um and then you know one thing led to the next we hired employees and we opened up additional states and markets and um kind of found you know who our consumer is and or at least our uh, original consumer and then started targeting them and selling to them and you know, I think that, you know, now we've turned in this all-inclusive brand. We want to sell to everybody. We want to, you know, uh, do good in the communities. We want to just be this nice, happy, loving brand that gives back and grows. And I think that that's how we've evolved and been able to kind of cover this national audience now. So where's your biggest market, you would say? at this point right now one of our biggest markets is here in michigan for yeah. sure we're a midwest brand uh, okay. wisconsin's a big market for us ohio kentucky um you know we just launched travis pastrana drink so you know maryland has turned into a major market for us Which we'll talk about charles pastrana in a second here yeah yeah um you know massachusetts yeah. um of course we've uh, have a big following in florida just because a lot of boat racing goes on there uh, we just opened up california and texas and nevada so we're pretty pretty excited about those markets so i think that you know um Right now, our, our hottest market probably won't always be our hardest market just because there's so many more people in the new markets that we're opening. I think that we're going to see a, a big jump. So I think the first celebrity, if you will, um, sponsor, partner that you brought on is John Daly. Yeah. So I met John Daly years ago when he came out to Bolingbroke Country Club. I think it was some charity event. This was before the beard and, you know. And I always tell people that, you know, when you, if you're a golfer and you're around a good golfer, someone that can just absolutely crush the ball, you have to hear the way he strikes that ball. It's so, the way he compresses that ball, and it's so unorthodox, the way he swings. I yeah, think. oh yeah. You know, instead of coming Everything about him. <laughs> it's, <laughs> the term grip it and rip it. Yeah. Yeah, it's John Daly. Yeah, oh, He's for sure. put smoke on that ball. Crazy. Yeah. So how did you come across that relationship and how... How has that, what has that done for the brand? Yeah, I mean, so I kind of met John just kind of organically, just networking and stuff with a good friend of mine. And, um, you know, at the time I was, uh, we had just the vodka out and, uh, you know, I asked John to try the vodka and he loved it. And uh, I think he drank the whole bot, the whole liter while we were there for about two hours. And um, we were in Nashville at Old Hickory Country Club and we kind of just became friends and uh, kicked off the relationship and then, almost a year later we said hey john you know we go to all these restaurants we see you know the john daly on the menu but they're making it with tito's or gray goose or whatever you know why don't we make the official john daly cocktail so it's the blend that you approve that's the same blend and everybody gets the same product that you drink and he's like that's a great idea and so i think that that just kicked off this relationship and then you know one thing led the next now we're doing all these events together john's charity works with our charity we do co-charity events and just you know he he, he um from everything you see online he's definitely that guy for sure but he's definitely like this really good guy that truly cares about making a difference he's he's very smart like some people might think that like he's just a drunk that golfs he's not that might just be the act he puts on but he's super dialed in and um he works super hard at what he does for sure so he's he's been a fantastic partner for us and um you know, just a terrific guy all around. I like to uh, spin it, spin it even further back. I always try to start the podcast with like point of origin, not in regard to company, more so, not even yourself, but where it all started for your entire family. So, you say third generation, grandfather started the trailer company. Yeah, he was. Uh, it was an engineering firm at the time. Okay. Uh, we he designed trailers for um, the different industries. Yes. Um, and. Uh, when my dad bought the business, um, 
nobody would build the trailers the way that my dad wanted them to be built and the way that they were designing them. So he decided to build trailers himself in a cornfield. Wow. <laughs> and so my dad was first generation manufacturing, second generation company, and then, yeah, we grew the business over the, the my dad's 40 years. Now is the, the lineage of your family all Michigan? No, uh, we actually, uh, I was born in Hinsdale, Illinois, okay. moved to Florida, um, and we had plants, Texas and Illinois and Michigan okay. all over. And then, you know, while we exited, we kind of relocated all of our manufacturing to Michigan at the time. And before I get into what drew you to Michigan, I'm always so, so what about like great, great grandfather? Like where, where's your like nationality? Like where, where's it all start? Oh, I can't tell you. I don't know that that much information. Oh, no. <laughs> All right. Well, let me let me come back a little closer to the future then. So, um, dad, grandfather, who had the most influence on you growing up to kind of give you this, this entrepreneurial spirit and soul that you have that's helped you create the things that you have in your life? Not only success in, in, in business, but also athletically. Like, there's no way that you can perform at a high level and not have like this. I just call it this dog inside of you. you know, yeah, I think he's competitive. Yeah, I think that, you know, my we just grew up and you know, I didn't necessarily have a super close relationship with my grandfather who was pretty old when we were growing up, but um I think that my dad just was a grinder. Like he just always made it happen and worked so hard. And I think when you just grow up around people like that, you just it just you just you know, just become part of it, right? Yeah. And and I think that especially in the world how it is today, like if you really want to win, you're gonna win for sure because not a lot of people want to win as bad as you want to win. And I think that, you know, that's how you get the dog in you yeah. probably you're just like, I really wanna be successful, you know? Yeah, absolutely. So, what about what was the relationship like with your mom? Uh, it was great, yep. Uh, they got divorced when I went into high school and so, you know, she spends time between Michigan and Florida too, just like my dad does, and I also spend time between Florida and Michigan and yeah. and uh, yeah, so we just all connect whenever. And so what was, you know, I, I was listening to, you know, other, other episodes you've done and just school wasn't necessarily your thing, but then you went into college, but not even in college, preceding college. What was, what were some memories that just kind of stood out to you that happened through, you know, middle school, high school, even elementary school that were kind of pivotal for your life and made you the man that you are today, whether it was extreme adversity or just like a big win, you know, a lot of like young entrepreneurs, they, I, I actually heard you started working at like eight. Yeah, I mean, I, yeah, my, we just always would have to, like, my dad was just always grinding, right? So we'd, yeah. we'd show up, we'd get a broom put in our hand or something. Yeah. I mean, just, you know, we just always had something to do. I think that, um, yeah, I mean, at a young age, you know, I did everything from all the different sports, and I was always very competitive. I hated losing, you yeah. know what I mean? So I probably hated coming in second. I'd rather just lose, you know? It's just yeah. like one of those things. And so, um, yeah, I think we just grew up that way and competitive, and we saw like kind of what my father was doing and how competitive he was in his industry. And I think yeah. that you know things like that mold a person at a young age, and you just decide like you know this is the route I want to go. Now, do you have siblings? I do. I've got two older sisters. And, and are they entrepreneurial as well? Uh, yeah, one sister uh, is an equine veterinarian in Florida. Another one sells medical devices in California. So okay. we all live on separate sides of the United States, and yeah. we all have our own thing going on. Yeah, let's go. Awesome. And so. Life's happening, you get into college, you get the bachelor's degree. Where'd you go to college and what was that like? I went to Siena Heights University, Michigan. It was fine, it wasn't a party school or anything like that. I never really went through the whole college party scene. I just kind of, uh, I was racing motorcycles at the time and uh, just kind of got it over with, you know? I mean, wasn't a big fan of school, but you know, had to finish to work for the family company and yeah. uh, you know, just kind of got through it. Is there anybody that kind of stood out to you when you were growing up outside of your outside of your father motivating you to just be a grinder that you were just like, they look like they have a sick life. Like I, I would do anything to kind of trade positions with that person. Yeah, I think that, you know, growing up, I knew that like all my hobbies were going to be really expensive. Yeah. And so I was like, if, like, if I don't make money, like I'm for sure not going to be able to do any of my hobbies. And so like I was always hustling cars or motorcycles or yeah. even at a young age, I was on Craigslist flipping mu old Mustangs and just like, all kinds of stuff. I just, um, you know, I always wanted to kind of have nice things and do cool stuff. And I think that it just costs money to do that. And yeah. you just have to figure it out if you want to do it. So it was more of a self-realization of like, I like nice stuff. I yeah, like I'd nice say most stuff. of my friends are older than me too. And so, yeah. you know, my best friend's in his 50s. And I think that, you know, when you hang out with these people and do the things that they like to do, like you want to kind of be at the same level. And so it just kind of really motivates you at yeah. a young age to like keep trying hard, you know? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, you graduate college, get into the family business. When do you start doing private equity? And what does that entail for you? Yeah, no, so just at the time, you know, we sold the private equity. So, you know, I was still running sales for our company at the time. Okay. I stayed on board and, um, you know, just uh, kind of maintained all my relationships with the customers I had. Okay. And then that, that transitioned into private equity. 
that I was working. Like we got we got blocked got by private. Okay, yeah. I see what you're saying. Um, so in the process of that, is that when Good Boys started? When you guys started? To get yeah, started? yeah. The tail end of me working for them, I you know started the business and kind of was working for yeah. both. You know, starting Good Boy while still you know maintaining my sales job at the time, and then um, you know Good Boy got busy, and then I kind of transitioned out. Okay, that makes sense. Now, what about you know you know I think a lot of people just get into kind of the cliche things of business and things like that, but like outside of your your personal hobbies that you display you know on on social media with all the racing and, and going fast and things like that like you know i think i saw a picture somewhere and i grew up in arkansas little rock and i like uh, hank williams jr and i was looking for it do you have like a hank williams jr like artwork or something in the crib? Uh, do you like hank williams jr or is that i don't know if i have any artwork from do you know you know hank's yeah, yeah 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 uh I don't know if I. Well, I wanted to bring up country music because I don't know if you heard. Um, you like country music, then I'm. Yeah, oh yeah, yeah. Yesterday, Toby Keith passed away. I saw that. Yeah, yeah. good friend John Daly's. Yeah, yeah. It's unfortunate. unfortunate. Yeah, I was gonna call him today and check on him. Yeah. So. Yeah, man. Toby Keith passed away, and I was like, I swear, I thought thought you liked country music, and I wanted to touch on that and see if there's any artists you've met. I was trying to see what the uh, autographs on those guitars were. Yeah, I think one's Toby Keith over there on the left. Wow. Yeah, and then we've got a Kenny Chesney one, and. Uh, we just have a good boy one that we just had signed by John Daly. You know, he's got his own album out. So yeah, yeah so Let's that'd go. be pretty cool. We got two more getting made. <laughs> Let's go. That's sweet. Who's your favorite artist music? Uh, I like everything. Everything? Everything. Yeah, I like everything. Just depends on the mood you're in? Everything, except for like probably super hardcore rap. It's probably yeah. not my style, but it, yeah, I listen yeah. to everything. Yeah, I feel just it. Just depends on the mood. I feel it, I feel it. Before I pass it back over to you and maybe get into more boat talk or something, because I don't know nothing about boats. <laughs> except how to wreck some jet skis. Uh, <laughs> um, I think the other thing I wanted to bring up is, I always ask everybody, usually towards the end, but I'm just curious now, do you like, do you like movies? Do you have a favorite movie? You know, I really don't watch much TV, to be honest Was there with a you. favorite movie growing up? Uh, maybe Rush Hour or something. Rush Hour? Yeah, I don't yeah. know. I just, now I just, my TVs aren't even plugged in at home. I mean, yeah. I watch maybe a movie a month, maybe, maybe for five so minutes before mo I fall asleep. movies in it. If, if you're not working or going fast, you're probably asleep. Probably. So, yeah. Okay. Yep. <laughs> okay. And did you I just have no, I don't know. I just, TV's not like, you know, it's no. not important to me. No, understood. You know, I think they, uh, Lamborghini, I don't know who, who, people, entrepreneurs say it all the time, like what they don't, they don't market, they don't have any commercials because they're, their consumers they're, don't watch yeah, TV. Yeah, consumers aren't watching yeah, TV. Yeah, I think that's probably pretty accurate. Yes. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. So, did you take the uh, gentleman's advice I told you to throw your laptop off the uh, not quite. I still have to work on the computer quite a bit. Yeah, still got the laptop. <laughs> I do have some good individuals though working for uh, the business now that help out tremendously. Yes. Yeah, for awesome. sure. Awesome. Let's we'll get back into some more boats and fast stuff, maybe. Yeah. Whatever's on your mind. So before we get into that, I've always wanted, you know, you know, when you when you study people that have done great things, you know, and you are in the midst right now of building a great brand. I know you know that, but I don't think you know that. You know what I'm saying? Like, I've watched you guys. We still got a lot of work to do. <laughs> I know you do. I know you do. But man, I'm telling you, this is you're you're you are really you're you're on this journey where. I think Good Boy Vodka is going to be a tremendous brand. Um, so I always want to, like, I always wonder, okay, who, who got them to think like that? And who's advising you along the way right now? Like, where do you draw your source of inspiration, information? Yeah, I just think that, you know, I, one thing led the next and we were just, you know, woke up and we're in all these states and we've got a big team now. And it's like, you know, you kind of have to make it work, right? It might not be what you, it is definitely what I want to do and I, and I enjoy it. But I mean, even if I didn't enjoy it, it's like I kind of signed up for it at this point, right? So mm -hmm. I think that you just have to learn as much as you can about the industry and figure out how you're going to differentiate and you're going to have to figure out how to win. And the biggest thing for us is finding all the all the buyers, right? I mean, every market is different, right? The, the New York consumer from the California consumer is much different. They've got different grocery store chains. Some C stores you can sell spirit based in, some you can't. So learning all these rules and where we can sell and all the regulation, it's like, you know, every state and sometimes even inside the state, like the cities um, have different rules and regulations. And so I think that, you know, we're learn I'm learning every day still about who the customers are and how to keep growing the business. So because your passion really originated from power sports, right? <laughs> Super bikes, you know, you hop on your own airplane and you fly to different places. Yeah. You drive boats at an ungodly speed. Yeah. Okay? Um, fast cars. 
So naturally, that's where you took your market, okay, to your, you know, with your product. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think that you know, we just uh, obviously being the founder of the brand. I think that you know, obviously, I attach everything that I do to the brand, right? I live, eat, and sleep the brand, and so um, you know, everything that I'm doing, we involve the brand, and I think that's kind of how we got that original demographic for sure. I see that. You know, you hear all the time that. You know, I mean, it's. I think it's a myth out there where people says you got to have multiple streams of income, and and that's all great. But you have to develop a strong stream first. And yeah, I love what you said. And you know, in a previous podcast, you said that you've gone all in. That everything you do revolves around the brand, your travels, your conversations, your social gathering, everything. everything. And I, we see that. We come to your home, and the everything good is good boy on the walls. You're stuff. a good boy, Bob. Yeah. Sure. <laughs> so. Tell me the mindset behind something like that. Yeah, I mean, just, uh, you know, you just, you, building a brand is tough, right? You're trying to get a national or a global presence and, and uh, you know, you want to be, rec- your brand wants to be recognized. I mean, every day you got to try to earn more consumers and teach more people about the brand and, you know, you kind of get stuck in the same circles, right? I mean, if you can't market outside of your 5,000 friends on Facebook and your Instagram followers or whatever, how do you reach all these other consumers, right? Just to, it's big, right? We've got 330 million people. So, um, yeah, I just think that you kind of have to attach yourself to your brand. Otherwise, it's it's already hard enough. This industry, if you don't, if you're not trying all the time, it's going to be impossible for sure. And you recently brought on a second, right, celebrity slash partner. We did, yep, yep. So John Daly was our original um, uh, partner that we made a drink with that was um, been very, very successful with us and kind of led our national expansion. And then, you know, probably one of the most unorthodox golfer, but so well known. And I mean, you could ask an eight year old or an 80 year old who John Daly is, and they'd probably tell you exactly who he is. I mean, it's incredible the following that he has. And then, you know, we were really trying to think hard on who's the exact opposite in the spectrum of, you know, where those what the followers are and and a demographic that brings and you know we partnered with travis pastrana and so he's been we just launched this drink actually just uh a month ago so how's that relationship been like awesome yeah he's he's a normal dude just like everybody else i mean he's awesome he's super nice um big family guy but of course he's got a crazy crazy travel schedule you know he's doing nitro circus all the time and he's got all his racing that he still does all over the place and you know he just broke his hand again last week so he's just you know in and out of the hospital the guys he's you know he is travis pastrana for sure yeah he lives life on the edge so you met him at a boat race you raced alongside him yeah yeah so uh tra- me and travis raced against each other uh, about two years ago now in michigan city mm-hmm. um actually just 30 miles south of here and um yeah kind of uh met each other at the driver's meeting kind of uh talked a little bit and then uh, we raced in like some really big waves and some of our boat broke off the back um and the piece that broke off the back was actually the john daly can that we wrapped on the back of the boat and so travis said his dream was to go golfing with john daly so we called up john daly and we were golfing the next week with him and john was hitting golf balls off of travis's chest and (laughs) they had a great time (laughs) so then we were like hey we should do a drink with you too you know and so we kind of showed him a little bit of the roadmap on how we launched the John Daly and, you know, um, kind of how our royalty agreements work and, you know, where this could go and what we could do. And then I think that, um, you know, we put our minds together with this management team and we, we made it happen. And what product did he launch? So Travis is from Maryland. Yeah. Um, so in Maryland, they have a drink called the Maryland Orange Crush. Mm-hmm. It's, a, it's very popular. It's on uh, probably all the menus there. And um, it's like orange juice, Sprite, and vodka kind of is like the, the mix. A um, little bit different than that, but that's kind of like the basic mix for people to understand. And um, yeah, we flew up to California, went to a tasting uh, uh, house with Travis and some of his friends. And we sat there and uh, kind of dialed in the recipe and, uh, uh, and the formulation. And then uh, we launched it a year later from there and it just launched about a month ago. So. so where can we get that product now? Who can, if we want that product, where can we get it? Yeah, so right now it just launched. So it's going out to all of our states. Um, out of our 26 states, it's probably in six of them now. Um, and, uh, you know, I'll tell you, Maryland is already crushing it with them. They've already sent four truckloads over to Maryland and they keep selling out. We actually hired Street Bike Tommy. Mm-hmm. I don't know if you know Street who that Bike is. Tommy. Yeah, the, the guy that jumped his Hypusa motorcycle over Travis's phone pit okay. one time. Yeah, he's, he's like, literally the guy has a smile on his face every day, all day long. And he was a carpenter. He's mm-hmm. like, hey, like, 
I want to come, you know, sell vodka and Travis's drink and whatever. He's like, I know all these bar owners. And you hear that a lot, you know, as you're like, okay, fine. Like whatever, you know? And so like, we'll, we'll try this out. And like within a week, I'm like, we need this guy full time. Like he's the man wow. and he's been killing it. Yeah. He's awesome. So that's crazy. And his energy is contagious. You know, yeah. it's just like when you have people on the team that are always so happy and like so nice and like the sky's always blue, right? And they're and and those are the guys you want yeah, because the other team members start to realize like, okay, you know, this is fun and great, and we're doing good, and like, let's, you know, it brings the brings the morality up on the whole team for sure. So do you still drive boats? Do you still race boats? Yep, still racing boats. Yep, okay. yep, racing again this year, um, and uh, looking to um, do some stuff overseas. Of course, again, we're gonna race the cows turkey again, which we showed you that photo when you walked in. Yeah, so that? that was cool. Oh, no, where's the cow? Where's that? Where's the, can you ask where that is? Uh, oh, <laughs> the cow's turkey. Yeah, it's yes, in, it's, 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 sorry. it's in, I'm, I'm it's, we have to assume that I think I everybody's in the boating audience. world. No. So go ahead. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. It's in, uh, it's in Europe. Uh, it's on the Isle of Wight. It's a big sailing Island. And then like, uh, for the cow's turkey, like a bunch of people come, I think it's like one of the world's oldest boat race. Yeah. It's like 200 miles of like insane waves. And it's, ins it's a crazy race. I think like when they first started doing it, like, a hundred boats would leave and like 50 would sink. Like <laughs> it was crazy. Yeah. What speeds can you get up to on that water? Um, it like the water changes because you're kind of going in and out of these different areas and the, the ways that the tides are pulling and stuff mm -hmm. like that. And so like, I think, you know, we started the race at probably 120, 130 miles an hour in a V bottom boat, which is pretty fast. And then, you know, at some points we were probably going 40 miles an hour. Like there was 10 foot waves, you know, it's yeah, it's crazy. Wow. Yeah, it's definitely tough on the back. Yeah. Yeah. And and what do you do? Are you the throttle man? You I was steer? steering. Yep. You're I was steer? steering. Yep. Yep. Okay. Yep. So tell me how for the viewers and the listeners that don't know about bow racing, how many guys in the cockpit? Who does what? And who's responsible for what? Yeah. So when we race the big cat boats, which we race here in the U.S., there's there's a throttle man and there's a driver. And so I normally always throttle. Um, and and the throttle guys in charge of the attitude of the boat, how fast the boat goes, and the driver drives around the the marks and um, is responsible for like looking around and reading the water and mm -hmm. um, you know kind of understanding what's going on and uh, as a throttle man you're just supposed to you know you kind of have your points you look out at and you're just watching the waves and if you gotta you know change that to the boat because you know cats um, pack air and so you know you don't want them to fly over so that's kind of the job of the throttle man is to not loop the boat over <laughs> so and then um for the cow's turkey there's three people in the boat there's a driver there's a throttle man and there's a navigator mm -hmm. and um to win the cow's turkey you have to go around very certain points mm -hmm. and if you miss a point you get disqualified so um you know we normally like in today's you know technology we put them all on the gps but you're approaching the marks at such a speed that you really have to be planning way ahead for and you have traffic and the waters are open they don't close the water so you could have sailboats and all kinds of stuff and so um the navigator is supposed to like really help the driver and throttle man understand you know at what speeds to go through the marks and where they're going to be exactly and pass them on the left or the right or in between and so uh, it's definitely a group effort to complete that race at speed so what kind of setup do you guys run in a big body of water like that when you got variable speeds You've got different water you got to adjust to. I mean, how do you set the boat up? Yeah, I mean, if you, if you know it's going to be rough, you can kind of put a, a rough water setup on it. Um, if you know it's going to be calm, you can put more of a calm water setup on it. But sometimes you just try to make, you just try to get in between because you know you're going to have big waves at one of the turns and you're going to have flat water in the beginning. So you don't want to jeopardize one or the other. Um, so you just try to put on the best propeller and depth on the drive that you think is going to, be best for that day but it's kind of impossible to, yeah. to guess it right the wind changes and it's a whole different ball game and so good boy is the sponsor of this boat yeah we sponsored okay. it last year uh it races uh um the british um i think they call it the british cup or the british um, powerboat association um we won the championship last year and um we're sponsoring again this year so okay. so what does it take what is when you're a sponsor of this team or this boat, what does that entail? And what is it? You give them money. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Money. Yeah. Give them money. And uh, the guy that owns it is, his name is Rob. He's a really good dude. Um, and it, it's it's a big passion for him uh, to, to travel and do all this stuff. And so um, he just, uh, he, he does most of the races. I only race one, one of the races with him a year. So. so it's his boat and you guys are the sponsor. Obviously you 
provide funding yep. for this, yep. right? But it's just Some set funding. up and you'll drive the boat. Yep, I'll drive the boat. Yep, normally the, the owner of the boat throttles yeah. just because it's like, all their very expensive equipment that they spend a lot of money on and so like uh, i see we don't always want somebody to throw out and you know sometimes the owners like to steer because they want to hire a professional throttleman right and so it just depends on what kind of owner it is um but rob is the guy that's very understanding of what's going on and very dialed into his team and like he yeah he's a throttle guy what do you like better throttle i rather throttle yeah i want to be in charge of how fast i'm going for sure <laughs> yeah. but if, you, if you're with a guy that you really trust then you know they have similar thought processes and yeah. how it's going to gauge how fast to go now you guys are talking back and forth to each other though right? yeah oh yeah sometimes okay. screaming yeah 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 yelling okay. at each other yeah yeah so let's talk about your personal boats what's your favorite boat why do you like it and what are you running now um, I've got an outer limits right now and uh, we've got a um, center console MTI being finished. Um, we just kind of, I just kind of always buy and sell boats, just kind of going back to the early days of hustling, but just mm -hmm. different now. I use them for six months, a year maybe, and mm -hmm. sell them and just try to always keep rolling the money forward and make a little bit of money and keep kind of going. Um, but I like, I mean, I, I really enjoy cat boats, you know, I like to go fast, but center consoles are fun, you know, if you want to bring your family and have some drinks while you while you're floating at the island or whatever you know can't really do that on a cat boat so unless you sell boats for a living usually guys i talk to in boating the word making money doesn't really come into the equation. yeah it's been kind of weird these last few years just because yes. covid has escalated all the prices so much it's made it kind of easy even if you're not even trying to make money it's like you just buy a boat and just the value just goes up you know because people can't get them you know there's a long wait list right now yeah, these are extraordinary times. I think the last three years is the only time I ever bought a boat, used it, sold it for exactly what I paid for. Yeah. Even. It's yeah. never happened before. Yeah. It's, yeah, it's crazy right now. I can't even believe the prices that they're getting for some of these. I mean, we locked in our price. We bought three three boats uh, in 2021 at the boat show, and we're just now getting our last one. Mm -hmm. And, uh, I mean, we locked in our prices pre-COVID, kind of, right, or during uh, COVID. And so yeah. we, we did okay on them for sure, but I think, to buy a boat now and pay those prices is yeah probably not in the cards for me <laughs> and where do you run the boats at now all over we do poker runs all over we like yeah. to you know we like to go to different places so everywhere hammer down is that your style yeah pretty much yeah, yeah. <laughs> break everything <laughs> we get the break-in period Let's yeah go. <laughs> yeah no we just we use every bit of the warranty <laughs> every time <laughs> yeah that's why we have to buy new boats you know because we we use them hard so yeah um but yeah they're fun we we uh got a good track record doing them and just kind of you know so it's, uh, we bring customers out and family and friends and it's kind of it's what i rather do like on a nice day you know instead of going golfing i'd probably rather go boating now will you wrap your personal boat too and put good boy on there yeah we always try to throw stickers on and do some cool stuff like that you know i think the days of uh you know wrapping the whole boats has probably changed we try to do a paint scheme that allows mm -hmm. for kind of a graphic to fit in um just because Full boat wraps are hard to maintain and they come off when you're running hard and stuff like that. It makes sense because it makes it easier for the next owner to just take the stickers off if... Yeah, exactly. That, yeah. You know? Yeah. I mean, if you customize a boat too much for yourself, it's hard to resell. For yeah. sure. Yeah. What about cars? You're a car guy. Yep. Yeah. I love cars. Yeah. Yeah. All kinds of cars. Yeah. Um, same thing. I try to buy them, use them, sell them, get them for a good deal you know, have fun with them, try not to break them. Cars are great because they don't really break, you know, boats break all the time, but yeah, you know, it's hard to break a car. I mean, they're engineered pretty well. Same thing yeah. with motorcycles. What's your favorite car right now that you have? Um, I've got a McLaren 720 that um, I had Cannonball Garage do some work in Chicago, where you yep. guys are from. Um, they're a fantastic company. Um, and so, yeah, it's fun. I don't get to drive it much because I'm always sitting behind my computer, but I keep it in Florida right now since it's 30 degrees and snowing outside. <laughs> yeah. But um, yeah, I love to go down and use it when I can. I think I first came across your social media um, when we were launching our uh, wine company, and I think you had a you had a hurricane at that time, and you had wrapped that bow that's on you know yeah thing, and then you wrapped the yeah, good boy on the uh, hurricane too. Yeah, I remember going to my business partner and be like. This is exactly what we need doing. Yeah. Because he just started a company. We need to be doing the same thing. Yeah. Yeah. No, I had a lime green Perfumante and just uh, put good boy all over it. And it was kind of when I first started the company, it was just like, hey, just just kind of by accident. Just like, I think it would be cool to have the brand of the company. Not because I was thinking full circle, you know, about how the advertising would work. But, you know, with, you know, you post it on TikTok or whatever the sites are, you know, and then they just, everybody starts following it and like asking about the brand. 
you know, that was cool, but I actually started following you. I, there was a post, and um, I don't want to bring up any names, but it was somebody you were dating at the time, and she was saying how really kind, how kind-hearted you were. And I, I guess it was a kid on that. I don't remember exactly, but she had said that this kid has always wanted to be dropped off at school in a Lamborghini, and so you picked him up. Oh, yeah, uh, yeah. And I got to tell you, that's, I, I, I read that post early in the morning, and I'm just thinking, man, what a cool thing to do, man. Like, yeah, I think I it was like, yeah, it was, a, it was a high school kid. Yeah, just took him to school one morning in the car. It was, yeah, it was kind of overwhelming because there was like a ton of kids out, outside when we pulled up. Yeah. <laughs> you know? So I was just like, yeah. okay. But I guess he always wanted to be yeah. driven to school. Yeah, as a local, local guy here at Lakeshore High School. Yeah, it was cool. Yeah. yeah, it's fun. I don't know. I like doing stuff like that. And that's the thing, you know, on social media, it doesn't, it tells a story, but it doesn't tell the whole story. And I've seen you at a number of events. I've seen how you interacted with, do you call them fans? Do you call them fans? No, I just, just, just people. Yeah, just people. Then. Okay. I see how people come up to you and introduce themselves. I see how you treat them. And I got to tell you, Alex, I think that is really one of the key reasons why you're successful is really honestly how good you are to people. Yeah. I think, you know, through, you know, the online presence you can always get some type of persona that doesn't probably match exactly who you are but i think in general like if you're just treat people right like a good karma comes around for sure you know and i just mm -hmm. my dad was always big into like hey, let's never burn a bridge they don't care how bad people are just move on and just do your thing right and so i think we just we just like burned in our minds as young children you know and so and i'm also like super thankful for everything too you know i know that mm -hmm. definitely required some luck and some good timing to do you know what we've done in our business in such a short time and yeah it's not easy out there right so you don't want to wake up and not be thankful for the opportunities you got who taught that to you is that would you say that i don't know i think i've just seen mom? like so many bad things in the world and life yeah. and i'm just like man i really hope that never happens to me and you're just like i don't know I, you can see everything on your iphone these days you know you just yeah. pay attention and you know it's just like yeah, it just, you gotta be thankful for what you got, for sure. I think that's the secret behind uh, the green room secret, if you will, that um, you know you see on social media, right? The lifestyle, you see a cool brand. Who doesn't wanna be in the alcohol business, you know? Yeah. And you see the travels, Tough. you see all that stuff, but I think that really the secret behind all that is honestly, it's who you are as a person, man. I've, I just, you know, seen it on social media is one thing, but I, I've physically witnessed you handling people and talking to people and yeah i think i mean to to, to uh especially like if you're you know a facebook brand you know people are gonna so the people that know you are gonna buy your product if they like you or not mm -hmm. you know if they, if they they think that um you know you got here in an artificial way or you're not real or whatever like you'll definitely turn off some consumers now for us i mean we need people to buy our product that don't know us that's that's how you actually win right because there's more people that don't know us than do know us right so mm -hmm. We need to grow the brand off of you know that initial reaction to our brand and our charity work and what we're helping to do the community but for sure all the people that you know do know you and interact with you you got to treat everybody if you're a facebook brand you got to treat everybody even more you have to go out of your way to be like hey how can i you know it's just you really have to you know uh you know be be nice and and kind and it comes back for sure you know people want to help and support you Forbes just recently did a really nice write up on Good Boy Vodka. They did. That was awesome. Yeah. I mean, yeah. they we we do these interviews and stuff with these with these guys and um, you know, we have to share some financial information sometimes, especially like with the Forbes guys and stuff, but we never know like if the article is going to come out or not. Mm -hmm. And so, like we don't get to proofread it or anything. And it just went out. We're like, "Wow, this is cool," you know? Yeah. And so, you never really know what they're going to write, but we were pretty excited about that. Did they approach you? You guys reach out to them? How did that Yeah, happen? I think you know, sometimes they reach out through like LinkedIn or um, we've got a chief strategy officer in our team that um, takes some of like our info emails and we just communicate back and forth. We never really know. And then, you know, they kind of say like, hey, wait, write for the Wall Street Journal or whatever, you know, and then we're just like, oh, we, yeah, we'll do it. And we'd love to talk to you guys. And then one thing leads to the next and then you figure out who they are and stuff. Yeah. That was really cool, man. Yeah. No, we're, that was awesome. Yeah, that was <laughs> that pretty was cool. Really cool. I've always wanted to be in Forbes for a long time, long time. That's yeah. a heck of an accomplishment, man. Three years in. I didn't make the years? Forbes 30 under 30. I really tried hard for that. Uh, I'm too old now. <laughs> You're not too far off. Yeah. Too far off. So. Yeah, I missed the cut by like five months or something. Yeah. So how old are you? 29. Yeah, 29. but you have to be 30 before, or you have to be 30 still into 2025. So I turned 30 this October. Yeah, so I missed the cut.
by two months. Yeah. So that's crazy. Yeah. Yeah. I would love to apply for that. I still have 40 under 40, right? <laughs> Just got 10 more years. Yeah. They figure it out. Yeah. That's awesome, man. So you still race bikes? You want to race bikes? Uh, yeah, don't currently. Um, yeah, I think it would be fun. I just, it's a priority thing, you know? Yeah. And I can't really get hurt right now. You know, it's, it's it would. I'm not really sure that you can ever really want to get hurt or get hurt. Yeah, I know, but I think you could probably, you know, make better decisions on what kind of sports you want to participate in, you know? So, so which one do you like better? Do you like racing super bikes? Do you like racing boats? Do you like flying planes? Uh, I like racing boats a lot. Um, yeah. I think it's, it's definitely, um, draws a big crowd, you know, and, and it's good for the brand. Um, but bikes are a lot of fun too. It's just, there's a lot of variables that go into accidents. And I mean, you could fall over on your bike, standing still in the pits and break your elbow. You know what I mean? It's just like, it's, uh, you know, you just have to, yeah, there's, um, it's a dangerous sport for sure. So, um, as long as you don't flip over in the boat, most of the time you're, you're pretty, pretty okay. You know, I love how up. everything comes back to the brand. It's better for the brand. Yeah. It's, yeah, it's all about the brand right now. <laughs> That's cool stuff, man. Tristan, yeah. you got any questions you'd like to ask? The only thing I've, I've got left is, do you fly yourself internationally? No, not internationally. No, no, I just, I fly a, I fly a Cirrus. Um, I call it my little time machine. Yeah. It's a little four-seater plane. They call it a five-seater, but it's a four-seater plane. And, um, yeah, if I want to go to Nashville, it's an hour. If I want to go there. How long is flight I fly to Florida all the time, back and forth from Michigan, 1,200 miles. So What's long? the range on a plane like that? It's about 1,200 miles. 1,200 miles. How long does it take you? Uh, about four and a half hours. And do you like put it on cruise control? Yep, autopilot the whole time. No, don't go to sleep. No, no. I was curious. I'm like, can you go to sleep? No. Flying? I just work on stuff when I'm up there. It's a good time. I mean, now if I were to go to Florida, you know, commercial flights two and a half hours, right? Faster. But I drive to Chicago. It takes me two hours. I got to park. I got to pay hundred bucks a day for parking. Then I got to go through the airport. I got to, you know, potentially get sick with a bunch of people I don't know. Then, you know, security. So for me to get in my plane that's five minutes away and fly down there, you know, relatively. And there's no TSA when you go up in the air and nobody no, you check in with? Nothing. Bring whatever you want. Full tubes you of toothpaste gotta, and shampoo, whatever you want. You don't got a radio like the FAA? And like you call that. air traffic control and you, you know, you file for your flight plan and stuff like that, but okay. it's all relatively easy. All, all you taxpayers pay for that. It's great. I was, <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Well, you're very welcome. Yeah. We're going to need a plane trip. Yeah. We are. It's, a, it's, it's a service for, for all of us pilots that it's funny. You're like, who pays all these people to like do all this? Work? Oh, the taxpayers do. That's awesome. So if you don't fly, you don't get the benefit of it. Yeah. So, but yeah, they, they, uh, they track you all the way down. They, they, they tell you if you've got traffic or anything that's going on. And so, um, you ever forgot to like log in and they're like, you know, unmarked. Un no, you can fly. Flight. You can fly. If you're not flying in certain airspaces, you can fly without talking to anybody. Oh, okay. It's legal. Yeah. If you just want to go up and do circles and you're not in airspace, you can cool. fly anywhere. Yeah. You can fly to Florida without talking to anybody. You just have to fly under or above certain airspaces. So what altitude on a plane like that can you fly at? We can fly, uh, the plane will actually fly up to 25,000 feet, but you need oxygen after 12,500. Okay. Yep. Yeah. And then, uh, so we have different oxygen masks for depending on how high we're going to fly for how long. I normally fly like 10,000 feet and just, you know. Um, now, is that high enough up, though, where you can avoid a lot of turbulence, or is it bumpy at 10,000 feet? Yeah, I mean, every day the, the winds are changing, and yeah. um, the, you, know, you always want to fly at the best uh, altitude for the wind because you always want to push. And if it's a super headwind, you want to fly low because it doesn't blow as hard down low. And so you just kind of, you know, for us, we fly anywhere between 3,000 feet and 10,000 feet and whatever, you know. Um, if you want to fly low and look at something, you can fly thousand feet you know whatever you want so um you just follow the the rules that they give you or you know we understand the maps and uh you know you it's it's relatively simple once you figure it out yeah so how hard is it to uh to get your pilot's license before you can fly solo uh it's just depending on how much you want to put into it you know i mean i got my pilot's license in three months i just flew every day and just studied and made it happen you know i just when i want something i want it bad you know and so um I also bought a plane before I had a license, so I really wanted to fly the plane. So, um, yeah, it, uh, sometimes it takes people two years, you know. Um, it just depends on how much you want to put into it. But I think to be a good pilot, you have to probably try to do a lot of it at once because if you just kind of piece it together, mm -hmm. I think it's more dangerous. And let me guess, the plane is a good boy plane. Yeah, it's got a sticker on it. <laughs>
<laughs> I love yeah. it. Everything's got a sticker on it. Everything's about the brand. I Everything's love it. about the brand. Yes. You never know who you're going to meet at the airport. Yeah. Yes, sir. You know, could be the guy that runs Publix or something, you know? <laughs> yeah. I think you put something on your storyline the other day. I think you had landed out. It was in Nashville. It was in Florida. But I guess Kid Rock's plane was there. Yeah, Nashville. Yeah, John Toon Airport. Kid Rock keeps his plane that says American Badass on the side. And the yeah. tail is him flicking you off. Yes. Yeah. That was awesome. His, his end number is like, he's born in 71. So I think it's like 71KR. It's pretty cool. Yeah, it's sweet. So now does kid, uh, does kid Rock have anything to do with Good Boy Vodka? Because I think I saw somewhere too that he was drinking, or maybe he was talking to John Daly. He keeps it in his fridge. Yeah, he, him and John Daly did an interview with Tucker Carlson. Okay. And uh, yeah, and uh, yeah, um, uh, kid kid loves it. He drinks it all the time. His refrigerator is full of it. At his house. He's good friends with Daly, so you know he supports Daly for sure. And so he has it at his bar in Nashville. Kid Rocks. Um, they sell a lot of product there. Yeah. Now, is there a partnership agreement with him, too? Oh, no, I wish. Yeah. Yeah? Yeah, that'd be cool. Yeah. Is he a cool guy in person? I've been, yeah, I've met him a few times. Um, he normally comes to some golf events in Nashville, okay. so we play golf with him and stuff like that. Um, yeah. Can he play? I think so. Yeah. yeah. Not bad. Yeah. Not bad. Okay. Yeah, he's good. Um, yeah, I think all Daly's friends can hit mm -hmm. the ball and have fun for sure. I don't think Daly has any friends that can't golf, because mm -hmm. Daly will just teach him, you know? But, um... Yeah, I don't think he's on tour or anything like that or, you know, close to. But he just goes out and has fun like the rest of us. That's awesome. I, John Daly is actually one of my favorite athletes, man. I, not it's so amazing much for his athleticism, do. but I just, honestly, I love his I love his whole mantra, his personality, and really what he stands for. I think he's just John Daly wherever he goes. He's still good today. It's insane. Yeah. Like we just, the Sanford International, we, we had a concert there and sponsored some stuff there. And John came in like sixth place. Of everybody on the champion store it's like <laughs> these guys are like waking up early drinking their juices running on the treadmill john's out till 3 a.m drinking with us i'm like john you gotta golf in five hours he's like i don't care yeah. he's still so good it's unbelievable yeah it's so cool it's what just a fun partnership it's just man. raw talent you know yeah yeah he's a good partner for sure yeah yeah so that has really done a lot for your brand then yeah, I think that, it, um, you know, through John's, you know, social media for sure and just what he does. And now if you look at him, he, anywhere he goes, he's got a can in his hand. You know, he's really behind the brand. I think um, his tour bus is wrapped. Yeah, we wrapped his whole tour bus in Good Boy Vodka. How cool is that? Yep, and all of his fridges are full and he's got this big wine rack that we filled with Good Boy Vodka and... Um, you know, now he's even talking to like, you know, he'll meet buyers, you know, Circle K buyer or whatever at these events and mm -hmm. he'll, you know, he'll pass on the information to us and they'll be like, yeah, we want it. We want the drink, you know? So, I mean, for us, there's an Arnold Palmer in every C store across the country. Mm -hmm. Why is there not a John Daly next to it? That's our pitch. And they're like, that actually makes a lot of sense. That makes so much sense. Like, why not? We want them right now. Yeah. <laughs> and so, so it works out good for us. Yeah. That's awesome. So yeah. that drink, I think I just learned today on the way up here that it's not carbonated. No, not carbonated. Nope. Yeah. It's not carbonated. It's real iced tea based, real tea based product. Um, and it's, um, you know, zero carbs, which is huge for people now. We're gluten free, four and a half percent alcohol. So we can sell a lot of different chains and stuff like that. I mean, it checks all the boxes that today's consumer wants in a product. Um, we actually have some syndicated data that just came out, like it's called IRI data. Um, John Daly's tea-based cocktail is like the fifth fastest growing tea-based can cocktail in the country right now. That's crazy. Yeah. In a short amount of time. I think that's the most impressive thing. Yeah, we're, we're excited about it. We're just getting yeah. warmed up. This is going to be a big year for us. Man, I got to tell you, I watched you just really honestly built this company from nothing over the last 36 months. And it's impressive, man. Yeah, I mean, we yeah. I was still kind of had a full-time job during 21 and 22. So, like, our real year was 23. Yeah. And then now 24, we're, it's, all, it's all hands on deck. You talk about wanting to be a nationwide company. What does that mean, nationwide company? It means that you're, all, you're available in all 50 states, you know, including Alaska and Hawaii, right, of course. Um, you know, which is tough markets, right? I mean, why do you want to be available in Alaska? Are you going to sell enough to... to generate any kind of ROI I don't know but it's part of the plan right they got stores there that have other chain business so um, 
you know, we want to be a national brand. We want to be available in all 50 states. We want to be in every major retailer. You know, we want to be everywhere that a Twisted T sells in or whatever, you know. And what does it take to be a national brand? A lot of money. Yeah. Yeah. You got to make the product, obviously. You got to make the product. You got to have, it. yep. You got to, uh, you got to have all the inventory available for all 50 states and you got to take the risk and like make, you know, no matter what you have to front the money to be like, I'm going to try this. Mm -hmm. I hope it works. Like, you know, you can take data and, you know, um, your metrics from your other states and say, listen, like. Michigan, for instance, is providing, uh, you know, a positive return. We've been in the state for a year or two years, whatever it is. We've got this many consumers over last year. Not only do we sell the product in, but the product continues to pull off the shelves. Our retailers are happy. Okay, the business case works. Now take that somewhere else, right? Florida. We sell into Florida. You know, we get X amount of customers first year. You know, once you prove that the business case works, you just keep moving it to state to state to state. And then if it works in 26 states, you're like, it should work in the, the rest of the states too, right? <laughs> and so, you know, we change a few things per state based on the consumer, right? How we market, who we market to, how much we spend on marketing, right? And we probably don't spend a lot in Arkansas marketing versus Texas, right? Because there's a a lot more people in Texas. It's there's not as many there's not dry counties like there are in Arkansas, and so you kind of start understanding this stuff when you are growing, and then you can kind of figure out where you want to make your spends and what the best way is to to, uh, to utilize your cash. Yeah, like they say, right in business, the path is always in the math. That is very true. Yeah, yeah. Don't get the math wrong. Don't get the math wrong because you can only get it wrong once. That's right. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. So what's next besides being a national brand? What about Alex Pratt as a person? What do you want to do? What's your interests? What's your goals, visions? Uh, I, I don't know. I've never been asked that question. I just, uh, yeah. I'd like to move to Florida eventually so I can get out of this cold. <laughs> sell, sell the house. Um, but um, yeah. Uh, Didn't you just move to Tampa? Uh, no, I grew up in Clearwater. We still have a family house there, so I go back and forth pretty often. Um, but yeah, I spend most of my time behind the computer screen over here. But um, yeah, I mean, I, you know, I want to race and do, I mean, for me, like my passion is racing. You know, like if I could race every day, then I wouldn't go to work. But I can't afford to race every day. Yeah. That's why I have to go to work, <laughs> you know. So, so you know, for me, like I want to do that kind of stuff for sure. I, you know, I like to advance and pilot, you know, training and get more certifications. I mean, that's all that's all luxury stuff, right? I mean, you, still, you have to earn it, right? So you gotta put the hard work in to be able to afford to do those things. And so right now I'm not so much thinking about myself, but more so about growing the business so it buys my freedom that I want the rest of my life. I love it, man, I love it. Justin, you got anything to add? I think we're good, man. Yeah. Close to an hour and a half in. Yeah. So if we want to, where can people find you, Alex? Where can they find Good Boy Vodka? Well, they can find Good Boy Vodka at, at goodboyvodka.com on Instagram, um, or they can go on our website, goodboyvodka.com. No, another episode of Diversity Kings. Make sure you guys like and subscribe, and we hope you enjoyed Alex Pratt. Peace Thank out. you, guys.